fight really, really hard, and they execute the system, and that's what it's all about. Yes, sir. Trust. He's pretty, big, big trust. Big trust. Big trust. Baby. Hey, yes, sir. <laughs> right on cue. Hey, right on cue. Hey, I, let me go. All right, we're back on the Jumbo Set Podcast, presented as always by Jimmy's Famous Seafood. My name, as always, is Jake Luke, and I am joined, not as always, by not Spencer Nathaniel Schultz. It's uh, Kevin Ostriker. I don't know your middle name. Raymond. Raymond. So, uh, Raymond. Yes, wow. Kevin Raymond. Kevin Raymond, huh? Everybody yeah. loves Kevin Raymond. That's right. That's right. I'll, I'll, try, I'll try to do my best to fill in Spencer's shoes today. I'll, I'll try to do my best Spencer impression. Yeah, they are uh, they're big shoes to fill. He's going to be uh, out for the night. He's got uh, some prior Oblos, got to drive 2-2 up to Hampstead, and then he is off to uh, Delray Beach, I think, for a couple mm, days. So good place. Nice, much needed R&R. He's going to have some fun down there. How are you doing, my friend? How's uh, how, how have things been? Things have been good. I and As you know, Jake, still on the tail end from you recovering from a pretty nasty sickness. I feel like a lot of people, I went to opening day, feels like a lot of people got sick. I, I've kind of pinpointed it as that's where it, I, I'm sure I caught something. It was a rough week last week, but doing better this week. Still got a little cough going on, but look, it's, it's a lot better than where I was, so I'll take it. Yeah, and we were talking recently, and uh, you said that you saw me at the game, but you were unable to uh, make your way over to me. I, I suspect that maybe it was you or maybe it was my brother who uh, got sick at the game. Somebody passed it to me because I was down for the last couple of days. That's actually why we haven't, part of the reason why we haven't had a jumbo set in a couple of weeks. I was traveling two weeks ago out in Los Angeles, so we weren't able to make that one happen. And then, yeah, I was uh, I was down sick. We actually tried uh, last Tuesday night. For anyone wondering, we tried, but there were internet issues. And then we were going to reschedule to Wednesday night, but that's when it hit me the absolute hardest. So, been a couple weeks off, but hasn't really been a ton going on in Ravens land anyway. A uh, little, you know, snippets here and there, as there always is, but nothing really that we needed to just absolutely pressingly needed to sit down uh, and cook on. But uh, we do have something today. Before we get into it, how are you? Uh, how are you feeling about the uh, general coverage of the Ravens? I know you're talking about them literally every single weekday. I, I can't imagine the uh, the mental toll that can take at a time when things aren't necessarily like cooking, you know, at all different angles. So how are you feeling about the state of the organization? I feel like, it. you know, they're in a place right now where I think we all knew this was going to happen in terms of them losing a lot of guys. Now, I think Derrick Henry brought a lot of excitement back into the fan base in terms of, oh, it's a big signing, but you know, now we're about a month over that. So there hasn't really been a lot of movement, but this is what the Ravens do. I mean, Eric DeCosta kind of talked about it. I'm sure we'll get into it over the course of this show, but we literally saw them sign Cal Van Noy last offseason. Well, it wasn't even the offseason. It was literally week three of the season. So we still got a long way to go. I know everybody wants to see the flashy signings and kind of getting all these new faces and learning about these guys. And in due time, it will come. But I think for now, a lot of people are just ready for the draft because, look, the Ravens have nine draft picks right now. And wouldn't be shocked if they use all of them or even maybe get one or two more. I don't know. Could, could be. Certainly could. And yeah, I guess that is sort of the one big nugget that we did miss was the Kyle Van Noy re-signing for uh, two years around nine million were thereabouts, I yeah. think, and five and a half million in the first year. I'm sure you're feeling pretty good about that signing. I know I was. 100%. Yeah, I think it was something that had to happen, especially after Jadavian Clowney walks to Carolina. And the, look, I'm loving the Van Noy contract more than the Clowney deal. Not that Clowney didn't go out there and earn it. He certainly did. And that's a big loss for the defense. But 10 million per season, considering Lamar's contract and all the other big deals they have. I mean, we, we know those type of deals, they're going to be harder to swing. Where we know the Ravens love that like 6 million, 8 million, 10 million sweet spot on some guys. You can't you can't have that as much with Lamar in some of these bigger contracts. So the Van Noy signing to me, he actually did had more sacks per game than Clowney did. Now, obviously, Clowney gives you something in the run game, but I thought Van Noy actually surprised me there last year, and plus his leadership. He was the best guy, and we talked about it, Jake, on, on Locked on Ravens a couple weeks ago or last week, where Van Noy kind of seemed like the the apple of everybody's eye after after Clowney was gone. Weren't really a ton of other guys out there. So, And DaCosta said, we'll talk about this, I'm sure, too, is he was the last kind of guy on the checklist, so maybe that's it till the draft. Yeah, it seems like it's going to be. So getting into the draft, the Liars luncheon, as it was known, otherwise known as the uh, the pre-draft press conference by the Ravens. 
uh, was held today at the castle over in Owings Mills between Eric DaCosta and John Harbaugh. We got a slew of sound bites we're going to get through and react to here. What's kind of your overall general sentiment on the Liars lunch? And I always think it's a lot of fun. And uh, I think in recent years, people have kind of caught on to the bit a little bit and they're not as kind of emotional. It's kind of not as spitfire. And maybe it's just kind of the state of where the team is at right now, where they're in a little bit more of a comfortable position than they were in recent years, where you're not having these emotional reactions to what DaCosta and Harbaugh are saying, where you're not having Eric DaCosta gritting his teeth and, you know, spittle flying out, talking about how he's quite insulted about the wide receiver position and things of that nature. What's your just general sentiment with the Liars luncheon? Yeah, I'll, I'll never forget that one where DaCosta came to the defense of his wide receivers. And now a lot of those guys aren't on the team anymore, just to kind of give an update on where that is, unfortunately. But uh, I think it's actually interesting because usually at these things, Jake, I keep an eye out and I've always wanted to do this, but it didn't really happen this year where – DaCosta or Harbaugh either will be asked or they will name drop a couple guys where I'm there's just like, oh, well, this position and then this guy, and they kind of go into detail and some depth. And sometimes that's obviously the reporters asking about a certain guy, or there's just a name that they drop. I don't think we got one name drop this year, yeah. which uh is a little disappointing because I always like to go back and I've never actually done it. I wanted to actually start this year, but go back and see, all right, how many name drop players at the Liars luncheon actually end up on the Ravens. I don't know the percentage or what it is. I don't know if you have any insight into like, if off the top of your head, you remember any guy. It's always like, it's always a guy that's out of reach, right? I remember in 2018, yeah. it was Roquan Smith. And funny enough, you know, right. they get right. their guy, right? A couple of years later where they trade the second rounder for him. Um, I think DaCosta had mentioned in Gakwe at one point, they go and get him. I don't think he had ever mentioned Marcus Peters. Obviously, Peters drafted well before EDC was uh, the GM. But uh, yeah, no, they they always they, they do kind of find the apples of their eye. But I do always kind of feel like they're like, oh, yeah, this guy who's going to go like top three. Wow. What, what a great talent. And it's kind of like, yeah, like we know, but like maybe give us something a little bit more. I do remember one year, maybe this was like almost 10 years ago at this point, like Bashadi was in there for some reason. And he was saying like, yeah, you know, I think round one, maybe we'll go O line. And then I think the second round we're looking at a pass rusher. And then, you know, day three, we're going to grab a couple tight ends. And like, it, they totally didn't follow that, but it was just a really funny like thing of like, and maybe that's really where the, the, ter the term liars luncheon comes from, where he goes out there and he says all this and it's like, oh, wow, what an honest owner. And then it just doesn't fall that way. <laughs> it, and I think the, the contrast to that is now Eric DaCosta and Harbaugh. And, you know, we heard it today. It was, yeah, well, there are great guys in round one on day two, on day covering all the bases of saying, hey, we might take a guy here, but you're not going to know when we're going to take a guy. And it's pretty, you know. People, the fan base is assuming, okay, well, the offensive line is clearly the biggest need on this team. They're going to draft a guy. And th there was a lot of talk about the offensive line. I'm sure there are a lot of sound bites that can get pulled from that. But there wasn't anything today where I was just kind of like, whoa. I mean, DaCosta mentioned a couple of positions where he said that they were probably going to take a guy at some point, praise a lot of the positions as well. I think the, the one, whoa, like big statement, and the Ravens actually put out the little quote graphic of it, was John Harbaugh saying, like, we're going to have – I don't remember the – I don't have it in front of me, but it was something along the lines of, like, we're going to have a great team next year. Like, you just watch her. And I'm like, yeah. oh, all right. Like, hey, go talk your shit, John Harbaugh. Like, go do it. Yeah, exactly. Like, and I didn't, I specifically didn't pull that sound bite. I kind of wanted to stay away from like the platitudes and like the this and that. I kind of wanted to get a little bit more nitty gritty, but that was just classic John. You know, they're down three starters on the offensive line and people are kind of questioning things a little bit. And he's got to get up there and do his fire and brimstone thing. I, I love John to death. And part of the reason is kind of that it, it border the bordering on hyperbolic statements where he goes out there and maybe he says something he, he shouldn't say because, you know, like if they start like two, you know, three and two or three and three, God forbid, people. Oh, yeah be pulling those quotes out i think people within the fan base more than out are going to be throwing those words right back at him so we'll, we'll see what happens with it but uh yeah that's i'm glad you called attention to that because i didn't pull it but uh just a classic john moment in one of these things yeah and we've kind of seen and you mentioned like the cast of defending the wide receivers hardball doing this like we know one thing they're confident in this team and you know, I know the fan base kind of gets into a panic a lot of the time about, you know, the roster and especially this offseason where it seemed like that first day they lost like six guys and it kind of is just now slowing down about a month later. But, I mean, they're a team that we see this every single season. They find their vets and doesn't necessarily work out. Like, I think last year, I'm not going to call that an anomaly because they've had success finding vets throughout the whole offseason, but – Man, I mean, the only signing to cost miss last year was Rocky Asin, and that was one of the higher compensation contracts he gave out. So 
it is kind of funny to go, and we'll, we'll definitely look back on that. Even if the Ravens end up having another great season next year, people will be pulling that Harbaugh quote through good and bad times, probably for the next five years. Yeah, he just he gets ahead of himself. Like he he gets on a roll, and it's almost like the Michael Scott. Like at, sometimes I start a sentence and I don't know where it's going. I just hope <laughs> I find it along the way somewhere. Like I kind of feel like that's where he gets with his emotions sometimes. Like he's very articulate and well spoken, but I I just feel like he lets his emotions run the day sometimes with the, these pressers and they you know that's why i love him like he's not he's not going to be the bill belichick go up there and grunt your way through three minutes of just completely unfulfilling audio he, he's a content guy which you know that's good for us and it's it's cha his personality and a lot of people talk about the coaching style yeah. but like he's definitely leaned into the whole like social media thing and like get being in front of the camera like that dancing last year we would yeah. we would have we would have never seen like 2010 2011 john harbaugh do something like that like he has molded himself not only into this like player's coach but like almost like this dad in a sense like the the, the fun uncle or fun dad going out there and he's like hey we're, we're gonna hype the players up how am i gonna do it i'm gonna dance like a like worst uncle moves you've ever seen like it's been kind of it's been funny honestly to see the transformation but you know what players love playing for him and i know there's controversy in the fan base about you know People either love or hate him, but his players love playing for him. And I know that's a fact. Yeah, it's a really interesting point there that you brought up with the way that he has changed over the, uh, the generations here. He comes in and he's kind of this hard ass, you know, beefing with Ed Reed and some of those guys. And Jimmy Smith said he completely changed from 2011 when Smith was a rookie to uh, the end of his career around 2018, 19, thereabouts. Uh, and really like the way that the world has changed just in those, you know, 15 years 16 yeah. years at this point with social media and everything and you know kids are just totally different now than they were at the time but i guess that's enough belabor enough john harbaugh armchair psychology <laughs> I, I probably i probably should make that like a you know lead pipe lock segment because i feel like i do that oh, you could so, yeah but yeah i mean either way we can uh we'll, we'll probably get into more of that even i think i've got at least one or two of them in here but starting out with our first uh sound bite that i pulled here from mr eric DaCosta, relating a little bit to something we've already talked about Oh man. Uh, well, I think it's a it's an average draft, I would say, uh, for edge pass rushers. I've certainly some guys at the top. For us, we've had success throughout the years in finding some guys in the middle rounds um, that have been good players for us. Um, you know, and it just it really depends on what you're looking for. You've got your speed rushers, your power guys, guys that can do both, guys that have to play in a three point stance, guys that can play in two point two point stance. Uh, so a lot of it has to do with just your fit. And what you're looking for, our coaches play a big part in that in their evaluation. Chuck Smith does a really, really good job evaluating pass rushers and has done a good job for us coaching those guys as well. So we'll get the board squared away. And certainly some guys at the top that probably won't be there when we pick. And so the challenge for us will be who's that next tier group of guys in that sweet spot between, you know, the 25th player to the 45th player that we have a chance to get either at 30 or at 62. First of all, love the Coca-Cola. Just always, always, always got it. Yeah, and he's he's called out his love for Coca-Cola in the past, so fantastic to see. But more to the uh, the what he was talking about there was pass rusher. We talked a little bit about the Clowney Van Noy thing, and I think losing Clowney is a, a pretty big loss in that pass rush department. You're losing about nine and a half sacks just with him alone. How big of a need do you think pass rusher is right now, just generally? And do you think that is going to affect their draft plans a ton? Yeah, I would have been a lot more concerned if we were if we were talking here, Jake, and Van Noy wasn't re-signed. But now that he is, I really, I mean, it just feels like the way they've set this thing up, they really wanted Afe Owe to take that leap this upcoming season where he can maybe be the guy next to Van Noy and have that impact potentially. I think Van Noy kind of changes some things in terms of where they will draft an edge rusher. I do think they will draft one. But we also saw Tavius Robinson play a lot last year, more than I was anticipating him to play, and actually gave them some pretty solid snaps, all things considered, especially based off expectations. So in this draft, and I agree with, with DaCosta, where it's like it's not necessarily an overwhelmingly good class. I mean, there are some good players, especially early, but they're not going to be in Dallas Turner range. That That's kind of the guy that's going to go probably in the top 10, top 15. You have a couple of other ones, but I think the, the one that everybody's kind of linking the Ravens is Chop Robinson out of Penn State, who is a I local guy. Are, that might be your guy. That, Chop Robinson <laughs> mentioned him, I think. Uh, in yeah, front of, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's done a visit too, right? He, yeah, and the fact that for a lot of fans, for the edge position in general, everybody values, and this, is, this goes across the board, it's always about sacks for a lot of people, where it does go far beyond that. It goes beyond the sack numbers. Robinson, compared to some of these other guys, 
does not have that actual production, but we have seen the Ravens take swings on those high athletic upside pass rushers. I mean, Adafi Owe is an example of that where he did not have a sack his final year in college, but the Ravens saw the athletic upside. They saw the potential and they spent the 31st pick on him. So I don't necessarily think Robinson actually falls. I think he goes in like early twenties to mid twenties. If he falls, it's certainly going to be a consideration for him depending on the offensive line. But I do agree with the Costa where it's not necessarily a class that wows me in terms of pass rushers. And I'd be perfectly fine if they were to take a mid-round player like a Javon Solomon out of Troy who has the production, but obviously then it's like, okay, it's not a power five school. Is that going to translate to the NFL? So I think you can go either way with it, but if I had to guess, I'm sure they'll throw a, one of their picks into a mid-round edge rusher. Maybe they'll sign another veteran and that'll be that. Drop Robinson's the most realistic top of the class guy though for them to potentially fall. Who, who knows if he does or not? Yeah, no doubt. I agree with you pretty much where they're at with it. Um, as far as it being a need, I, you know, I, I believing in Oway, I think they do. I think there is a little bit of a risk with it necessarily, especially in terms of sack production. And you mentioned that um, they don't really consider sack production the end all be all. They said that recently. I, I forget which presser. It might have been the combine or something. But they said that in relation to Oway. And then earlier today at the at the press, presser, I think Kyle Barber asked about. Uh, fifth year options for Bateman and Oa are coming up in a month, and they were very ambiguous about that as they're wont to be at one of these things. But yeah, it's just kind of it's one of those prove it years for Oa. It's almost like he's one of those, you know, third round pick, fourth round pick guys that they get that's going to have to come out and have a massive sack production year. And if that leads to a big contract, maybe it won't be here, but they'll have at least gotten that need filled uh, for this past season. And then let's say they did draft a guy. Uh, you mentioned your guy out of Troy there, or maybe another guy in the mid rounds here. That could be kind of their replacement uh, for him if he were to walk or, you know, hopefully they just re-sign him. But things are a little bit tighter now in the post Lamar Jackson contract era. So this edge position is certainly going to be one to watch. Uh, yeah. Next one that I got. Well, it's great to have additional picks. You certainly have to have players that you cover and that you want to draft. And so that's always a factor with every draft. I mean, you could have 15 picks and sometimes you're there and at the end of the draft and you're looking at the board, and you have no idea who you want to pick. You just don't see anybody that you really covered. So, um, you know, I always think about it as like, what picks do you need to get the players that you want to take? So you, you can have some, some great picks, but if the board doesn't fall the right way and you're looking at a bunch of players that aren't any better than the players you have on your roster, those picks really don't help you very much. So I like the idea of having more picks, but I want to have more picks in a, in a specific range, I think, in the draft. And if we can get that done, then I could see us, uh, you know, be in a good position to really maximize our chances to find good players. As far as the fifth year goes, I mean, yeah, there is an advantage to having an extra year uh, if you want that extra year. So um, all things being equal, if you trade out of the first round, I think that you should get a premium uh, if you're going to do that to give up that additional year. Additional year. Ravens currently have nine draft picks nine picks nine times so they've got a one at 30 they've got a two at 62 three at 93 two fourths uh 113 from the jets uh which I, I think that was the morgan moses one correct me if i'm wrong yep. uh yep they've got another fourth at 130 uh fifth at 165 uh six which is not their own it's a compensatory from the jets uh at 218 they traded their six last year for andrew Voorhees to move up uh, a seventh, another one from the Jets. Look at the Jets, just giving them every every pick here. Uh, seventh rounder at 228, uh, and then an additional seventh rounder at 250. Do you think they need more picks, or do you think they're good with where they are? I think nine is a pretty solid number. I think for this team, anywhere in the eight to 10 range, I think is where they're probably going to end up. But I, I do agree, and DaCosta makes a really good point, because I'm doing these mock draft simulators, Jake, you know, doing them like every week. And they have three picks in the 200s right now, essentially. And by the time that like 250 rolls around, I'm just like, I'm like, I literally have a guy. It's Jacob Monk, a guard out of Duke. And I'm like, I'm just picking Jacob Monk because at this point, like I've addressed every need. I've done the BPA thing, like I, even like the lesser needs I've done. So I'm just like. There's no one at that range who falls to me where I'm like, oh, this is a fourth round prospect. I mean, that was Voorhees essentially last year, but that was due to a massive injury. So I'm just like, all right, where where do I go here? And I'm sure that's some of the mindset these teams have too, where I'm sure that, look, there is a possibility they trade back from 30 and they get like one of the you know first picks in the second round, add another pick in there. But there is that sweet spot of 
where there are enough, like a group of talented prospects, like for the corner group, for example, the Cotton talked about that. A great sweet spot is like second to fourth round with those guys. Like there are a bunch in that range or with the offensive line. If you want to grab a guy in like the fifth round, like early five, you can do that. But once you start getting into like having three picks in the two hundreds, it can get a little bit. Okay. We've already addressed all these needs. We've already taken seven guys. And you also have to be wary of the fact that, okay, are all these rookies going to make the roster now in a post Lamar Jackson contract world, you rely more on draft picks. So draft classes, I think are generally go generally going to be bigger in that in terms of getting the swings and Eric Acosta has been very vocal about, hey, you know what? The more swings we get, the better chance we have of hitting on a guy. So I think they're going to be using that well. I mean, they're in line for four comp picks next year because of all the guys they lost. And that's not changing even if they sign all these guys because of how many players they've lost. So I do think that there is a sweet spot and every class, every draft is different. But I wouldn't be shocked if Acosta tries to pair up some of their picks now to move up and then move back from another. I mean, we know this team loves moving up and down the draft board. You know what they love doing is picking like 50 times in the fourth round. They always pick yeah. the first round and then they trade back from this, their second, they trade back from their third and they acquire. I remember 2016, they had like five picks in the, in the fourth round. Yeah. That was the year they got like Chris Moore and a bunch of those guys. Yep, in Tavon field. Young, all those guys. Tavon Young, yeah. And like it's hit or miss, but like Tavon Young was a good player for a number of years. And, you know, Chris Moore, good special teamer. Like you can really backfill a roster uh, by doing that. So, and you know, they did it last year, right? When they picked uh, all those guys with stout and all, oh, you know, man. all those dudes <laughs> in the fourth. I mean, it's, it's just one of those things where like, you're, you're probably going to luck your way into some decent players in the fourth round um, in particular, because it is kind of the top end of that, the bottom barrel, right? Where it's the, the beginning of day three, plenty of good players have fallen. Plenty of guys on your board have fallen. And, you know, you, you afford yourself the opportunity to double dip at a position where you pick a Charlie Kohler, then you pick Isaiah Likely after him. And Isaiah yeah. Likely is looking like a top 15 tight end in this league, at least right now. And then Kohler's there, and he caught a touchdown last season. We'll see what happens with him. He's your third tight end right now. That's pretty strong. So, you know, it's definitely good to have a ton of picks. And I think they the max number they seem to max out at is like 14. It gets a little more preposterous beyond that, I think. So yeah. with them having nine, I could easily see them trading back at least once or twice. Uh, and then getting up to that 13, 14 range and really trying to, like you said, with, you know, it being the post-contract era, uh, this post Lamar Jackson contract era, it's going to be, the draft is going to be coming at more of a premium than it even was before. And they already placed a ton of importance in it. So I'll be interested to see what they do with that. But nine is, you know, it's a decent number. It's funny. You yeah. see these, like, see these teams around the league and the Rams are an extreme example, but like, you'll see them have like three or four in one year. And the Ravens are always like sitting there with like double digits. So I'm always tickled by that. Yeah. You know, if you want, to have a successful NFL career, all you have to do is be the second tight end drafted in a draft by the Ravens. Yeah. I mean, it was, what is it? If off the top of my head, Max Williams and then Nick Boyle. So obviously Williams, you know, kind well, of even before around. that, you got uh, Dixon and then Pitta. In yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Dixon and Pitta. And uh, obviously the big one now is Hurst and Andrews and yep. how Andrews turned out. And then it, it's likely in Kohler where, you know, and I think likely was before Kohler, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe yeah. that breaks the trend. I'm not, I'm going to, I thought he was after. I could be wrong on that. I, I, I'm going to look it up I, well, during the next soundbite. I'll, I'll come back with that information. But either way, the way that the Ravens do things, and I remember that a couple of years ago when they had all those fourth round picks, I'm like, there's no way they, because it was six guys, six picks. And I'm like, there's no way they take six fourth rounders. And, I think when I realized it, honestly, was before the first pick was even made because it was Falele, and that was a guy that people some had a second round grade on him just because of his athletic potential in general. And I thought they were going to trade a couple of their fourths and maybe their third and move up just to get a higher day two pick, and it never came. And I'm like, well, you could pair like two of those 130s and move up into like 115 range, but if they didn't trade up on day two and I'm like, Oh my God, they're going to take six fourth rounders and I'm not going to know what to do. And it, it was crazy, but I think we're going to see that a little bit more now, especially post Lamar Jackson contract. What'd you think about the, uh, and I didn't pull this audio, but I'm sure you uh, took note of this Eric DaCosta kind of joking around about the uh, Steve Bushotti reign of terror <laughs> idea, where you trade up from the seventh round of the sixth one year. And then you go from the sixth to the fifth next year. And then you go from the fifth to the fourth and then the fourth to the third and then the second to the first that, you know, that, I, I kind of really, uh, really enjoy that idea as my uh, video goes out here. Give me one second. Yeah. I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk while you're getting your video going, but 
I, I love that idea. I'm so curious to see if it would work, though, just because, you know, of the fact. And I see I'll, I'll do this and I'll talk about it. But it's so funny to me because, like, it theoretically could work because it's essentially the value chart where you trade a seventh that year for a sixth next year because a guy, a team might really want somebody. Then you move and it's like, all right, well, now you move the sixth to a fifth. But then it becomes a little dicey because I think once you get to, like, the fourth round or something like that it almost becomes a little bit of oh well fourth this year for third next year is a team going to want to make that swap but then it's it, it almost has to come in a trade with other things once you get to like the third round because you do a third in this year for a second next year i mean you you could do that but at that point it like almost things have to happen in like a certain realm where then you go second to first and that has to be, I mean, there's no way a team is just going to say, we're going to give you a first for pick 40. Like you're going to have to move some other things in there. So I think it's almost like those videos. And I don't know if you've seen these Jake of like trading up from like a paper clip to a house or something like on YouTube, like people do that. Essentially that's what that is where like you move from, all right, you get the seventh and then you're trying to trade up to a first. But I do think at a certain point, you're going to have to start throwing some more stuff in there, especially once you get to like. But it's almost like the Rams thing trade. where it's like you roll it over, where it's like if you trade a pick, yeah. like it doesn't, it ceases to matter because you just keep trading them and trading them and trading. And like, you know, it's like, oh, you know, another one next year, but then we'll trade up, at, you know, from the year after that into that spot. I mean, it's kind of like a domino, uh, a you know, infinite domino type situation. Yeah. I love it. I would love, and maybe we'll see, you know, those, those things is like, Oh, I might win the lottery, and, but you'll never know. There'll just be signs. Like, oh, yeah. I think it's'll be like, Oh, we're going to do the Bashadi reign of terror, but you'll never know. It's just going to be signs. And we'll, yeah. we'll start to see that like, Oh, the Ravens traded for a six round pick next year. They traded their seventh. And that's like the beginning. Every seven years, they have two first round picks. And that's how, you know, it's like, Oh, I would we love it. We're coming up on the seventh year uh, here of the uh, reign of terror. And now they have, uh, they have their yeah, two. It's, like, it's, it's a, it's a local holiday. Like, you know, when it's coming. Yep. Exactly. Apologies for the, uh, the camera issues here. I don't know what's going on with my camera. I had some issues with it out at the, the tailgate. It, it died on me out there as well. There's oh. you know, no indication there's anything wrong with the battery, but you know, the show must go on. I've got my That's webcam right. and we're, we're all good. Uh, moving on. Yeah, you know, I, I don't see any unique challenges picking early, picking late. It's, it's really the same, you know, it's just, having the players that you really want be there when you have to pick and you know if you have a, a typical draft if you're picking 10th you maybe have four or five guys you really want if you're picking 28th or 30th you might only have 15 or 20 guys that you really want and you, the way your brain works you kind of like ascribe a, a, a value to players and you're hoping to get that value at that pick you you really want to get value and so for us it's just like you just hope and pray that you know one of those you know top 20 guys might be there for us at 30. So we have some additional value associated with that. But uh, in the end, you just grade the players and you rank the players. How does being at the end of the first round kind of change the strategy for you here? Because we've had a couple years in a row now, and I know they've been in kind of the mid 20s, but I look back at that 2022 when they get Hamilton at 14 and then, you know, they trade back into the first round, getting rid of Hollywood, picking Linderbaum. They're 30 now. This is the farthest back they've been in a while. How do you feel that's going to change things up for them strategy-wise? I think it could, especially when you start talking about tradebacks, because, you know, when you're 22, when you're 14, you have technically more value in your pick because it's higher up in the first round. But with those picks, trading into the second round, like that's a far drop from 14 to, let's say, 33 or from 22 to 33. With 30, and this is how it works for a lot of teams, is when you reach your pick, you probably have six or seven or eight guys who you'd probably feel comfortable enough taking at wherever you are. So for 30, when Baltimore gets there, of course, you know, and I agree with Casa, where it's like you would love to have that like Kyle Hamilton fall for someone who reaches 30. And then obviously it's a no brainer. But if that doesn't happen, I'm sure Baltimore will get to their pick and they're going to say, yeah, there are a couple offensive linemen. We, feel comfortable taking here maybe there's a wide receiver or two maybe there's a corner maybe an edge is there that they like and then they can evaluate and say well if we move back let's just say they move back four spots or five spots they're still at a very worst case scenario 
they have eight guys, they move back five spots, they're still going to have three guys they feel comfortable enough taking at 30 that, that will be there for them at 35. And plus you can get maybe an extra an extra piece in the third round this year. Maybe they take on a 2025 second or third. I love those trades where you move back out of the first round, you only move back like 10 spots and you pick up an extra 2025 second. Like that'd be my dream in a trade back scenario for Baltimore. This class is good enough, especially at offensive line where there would still be a guy personally, I think available if they only move back a couple of spots, they could trade up if they're getting into a range with either a really good lineman who's not supposed to fall really good wide receiver. It's almost like what was going on with Kyle Hamilton a couple of years ago, where I think we reached 10 and I was like, okay, trade everything you can for him. Like you have to get this guy. Yeah. And luckily he fell to 14, but there are always those guys who fall. So I could see a trade up, but I think the more realistic scenario is they like enough guys at 30 where they can trade back a couple spots. Like Xavier Leggett is someone who I kind of pinpoint from South Carolina, a wide receiver who will probably, to me, he falls in that like T Higgins, Michael Pittman Jr. range, that like first pick in the second round, second pick in the second round. You get that, you move back essentially four spots and you pick up extra draft capital. So I think it does change the strategy, but doesn't change it dramatically. Like Eric Acosta was saying there, you're still going to grade the player, still going to evaluate. And if there's a guy you love on your board at 30, you're going to take him just like you did at 14 or like you did at 22. Yeah. And it's a, it's a weird spot because you basically are in the second round at that point value wise. Yeah. But I mean, and they talked about this in an earlier soundbite, that fifth year option, that's pretty valuable. And I mean, they're, they're going to have the, like we talked about earlier, they're going to have the chance to exercise that with Bateman and Owe and we'll see what they do. But I mean, that's a, an additional year and yeah, it's an expensive one, but you can tack that onto the rookie contracts, which, you know, the NFL has completely changed under the 2011 CBA uh, to where rookie contracts are just so the window is so short. You've just got to get as much out of these guys as you can. Uh, while they're still, you know, affordable to you. And yeah, I think that probably will affect the calculus a little bit where it's like, yeah, you know, we could trade back and get like another fourth or whatever. You know, we could trade back to like the third pick in the second round and our guy will probably still be there. But I mean, don't we want to have that fifth year option? So maybe you just hang there at 30 and uh, we'll talk more about trading up. I think I got a soundbite on that as well. But uh, in the meantime, moving on. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be competitive. <clears throat> There's going to be a competition for those spots. I mean, the best, whoever plays the best, we always say, who's the best player? It's the player who plays the best, you know, and you could have been the best player five years ago, but you're not the best player now. So uh, every day you go out to practice, every game you play, there's an accumulated um, uh, established aspect of it. But right now we're a little more open. So those guys that you're talking about are going to be competing with whoever comes in here and we'll just see who does it. But I think those guys are ready to compete and do well and They'll be in here Monday. Can't wait to see them. It's going to be great to see those guys in here Monday working hard and see what happens. So he's talking there about the offensive line. So you've got Andrew Voorhees. You've got Ben Cleveland. A couple guys in the mix here, right? But draft is coming up. And like we said, nine picks that could very well turn into double digits. Uh, how many offensive linemen do you expect that they will draft? Because I have a feeling it's going to be multiple. I think it's multiple, too. I mean, I, I have the minimum, two. I could easily see it being three. but to John Harbaugh's point, they do have a lot of guys who they have accumulated over the years who are now going to have an opportunity to go out there and win these jobs. I think the way that I kind of see it, and again, stuff happens in this league where like the most obvious path is rarely the one that's actually chosen by these teams, like something crazy is going to happen. But the way the, the tackle class is, there are six to eight guys, depending you know on how these teams grade them, that you could argue have a first round grade and you could argue in a different draft class where it wasn't as deep, these guys who could potentially fall to 30, maybe they'd go in the late teens or early twenties, just because of how deep the class is. But you do have guys like Ben Cleveland and Voorhees and Sala and Falele. And even if you want to throw McCary's name in there, you can Josh Jones, who they just signed. I mean, it's, it's either new John Simpson. It's, you like, know, it's weird. I feel like McCary is penciled in as a starter right now. He's well, on ESPN. He's in, and Ramey put this out on Twitter. He's penciled in twice. He's literally their starter at both left guard and right tackle. So Damn, like that's, that's value right there. That's yeah. Let, can you imagine? I mean, after every game, McCary having a you know takes the snap at, at guard, runs over to tackle. Like just yeah, th he is the definition of a Swiss Army knife. And honestly, yeah, literally, yeah, literally. 
and the thing it's almost like you can imagine like it's almost like in madden you like have you make a copy of mccarry and like it's the same player at both positions and i i I just think he's such a valuable piece to them but honestly my, my opinion on him is like he's more valuable as their backup he's an expensive backup and he's a star, he's a starter level player. Like I'm not trying to discount his talent, but to me, it feels good to have a guy you know can play off five positions, and it's essentially a seamless plug and play if a guy does have to miss some time. So I think the obvious choice would be to pick a plug and play tackle, either if that's the first round, second round, third round, whatever it is for him. But then it makes sense to maybe you know kind of ha- hash it out between these guys at the guard department. Like, will Ben Cleveland go and have a Ben Powers type contract year, where Powers was kind of not living up to potential through his first three years, comes in and earns that big money deal from Denver? Could Cleveland be that guy for them this year? Could Josh Jones be their John Simpson this year? So three starters is a lot, and it's a lot of talent to replace too. But I'd anticipate them probably getting at least two offensive linemen. And if they get more picks, I could easily see that number bumping up to three. Yeah, I love Josh Jones as a deaf piece. I'm glad you you brought him up because that was a pretty under the radar signing. And he is one of those guys who's still relatively young. I could see Joe D working some magic with him and getting one of those kind of surprising like, oh, wow, this guy's like a pretty decent right tackle here, like four weeks into the season where you've got like Nate Tice and all these guys posting clips about him. Could totally see that happening. Ben Cleveland, it's that's a really tough one to bank on, man. I just like the work ethic and some of the stuff that you hear. It's just it's not all great necessarily. I'm sure he's a good young kid, but you know you, you kind of hope that he's he's gotten his head on straight here in time for what's going to be a pretty pivotal contract here for him. And then overall, it's just a strategy. I think I've been saying this a while now, and it's something that I think they should do at a lot of positions where I think they will draft a, multiple guys. I think they will be drafting at least one of these positions, guard or tackle, pretty highly. And letting them duke it out with a vet and then i think they will buy their time and they'll wait for you know some sort of veteran like a zeitler type or a john simpson type to come available they'll sign them throw them into the mix and then i think you'll have two rookies maybe one of high pedigree maybe one of kind of that mid-round pedigree versus that veteran and i think you're gonna have a pretty uh, pretty decent battle in camp i th- think things that think things are gonna look a lot better for them uh, a couple months from now yeah I, th- I think and even you also have to keep in mind that like even with salary cap casualties, there are always there's always like that guy or a couple of guys where you're like, oh, wow, a team really let go of this guy. And sometimes it is on the offensive line. And I think for me, the most important part of this whole thing is going to be continuity in training camp. I don't know if this if you feel the same way, Jake, but it just feels like the offensive line hasn't had a lot of time, like the full starting five to gel over a full off season in a while. Like even in 2021, it felt like, there was a new injury like every other day on the offensive dude, line. Dude, I mean, like, look what they've been doing with like platooning guys in and yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's crazy. And like, they, to be fair, they make chicken salad there. I mean, they, that was a tough situation with the way Ronnie Stanley yeah. was playing and his health and everything. And, you know, Morgan Moses, obviously, he went to the Jets and then he revealed that he tore his bicep or something like that. And he, he didn't get right. surgery on it, opted to play through it. So, you know, shout out to those guys for gutting it out and making it work. And shout out to the coaching staff for being creative and making it work. But it really does speak to the fact that this room did need to be blown up in the way that they've done. They were just operating at a deficit talent wise and health wise. And I think uh, it's going to be good regardless of whether it really works out for 2024. It's going to be good for the long term that they're rebuilding this room right now. Yeah, and we know that Baltimore has their traits they love in the draft. Obviously, they're an arm length team. They they rarely go out there. And and I know, yep, exactly. You know, I think they should they should bring Craig Kimbrell in there and do his little his little arm thing. Yeah, well, there, yeah. Guys, uh, they need to have guys T stand like in a video game when you glitch out and you're like T standing. <laughs> like yeah. that that could be the new strategy, is you know, you, you build that wall and, and all of all of them are just T posing. Like yeah, you just have them, have them T pose. I'm I'm in a corner here, so I can't really stick my full arm out. But, yeah, I'm a little you know, I'm a little I, I got I got a wingspan too. Maybe they'll recruit me, but I'm yeah, I, I do not. I'm five six and twenty four twenty fifth. So I, I my, my arms are short anyway. So I, I'm not well, a good I'm offensive line. Uh, I'm gonna start calling you Lil, Little Kevin Ostriker because I I'm calling <laughs> Tony Kemp Little Tony Kemp because he's five six as well. So hey, you know if I if I if I am in the same group as a professional ball player right now, I will take it. So exactly. I mean, that's what I'm saying. They, our short kings. Don't, there there is no ceiling to what you can do. That no is fun. true. That is true. And you know I, I work with with the Ryan Ripken show now. And all I was gonna guys, say that's there's, there's all, a lot all of them are like six foot there's, plus and there's a lot of units on that show i know and even i remember when we did our uh you know when bobby had his thing a couple years ago and i met you at you and spenny for the first time it's like you two are tall 
tall guys. We're like, sneaky, yeah. We're sneaky big as well. You know, it's not we're not necessarily former ball players or sons of like the great <laughs> athletes of all time, or you know, Zach or or uh, Rocco or you know Bradley. But you know, we we've got some size to us as well. Yeah, and R- Rocco and I are kind of the short kings there. But I remember it was you, you and Spenny were like the big guys, and then Bobby Cole and I were just kind of like looking up. It, it, you, yeah, guys. Listen, you, you need some you need some versatility on the roster you need, you need you need to build the basketball team so that is true i think even for this team i mean a lot of people a lot of draft people were like oh for linderbaum is his size going to be an issue like i don't really discount like even when earl came in like this is kind of a weird sidetrack just because of how real weird the earl thing was yeah. but a lot of people were like oh well he's too small to play a safety position in baltimore and like he can't do it because he's so he's a smaller player and i'm just like i don't really care about like it might just be because i'm short myself but like i don't really care about all that like if you can play you can play now earl played it's just everything else was yeah, he played. He played pretty well. I mean, to his credit, but there was maybe a lot going on there. Interesting, interesting by Eric, by the way, to bring that up on the uh, that Adam Brenneman podcast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he talked pretty candidly about him, and uh, I thought he was like, you know, based upon his uh, Kenny Young story, where he really sort of went in on him, and he he wasn't shy about making it clear who it was. I think I think he kind of intentionally put it out there that Kenny Young, quote unquote, kind of an idiot, allegedly, not my words, his. <laughs> Um, but yeah, the Earl Thomas, he was like, yeah, you know, I just, I'm not patient and I rushed and I didn't do my homework. And I think we, I think we even got a quote down the line here about him not being patient, but, uh, yeah, that was, a that was a good interview. Another thing we, uh, we tried to cover, but, uh, we weren't able to get the recording done. Yeah. I, I am, I do not know the last time I've heard a general manager speak so candidly about just a player like that. And I think those sound bites are good. Like yeah. I know it w- was, it a little harsh, like, man, like I, he's like, oh, this guy's an, in- First of all, I don't know. Have you ever thrown an ice cream cone at like an open trash can like that? I like, yeah, I mean, that was like the, the weirdest part of it for me. It kind of gets lost in the fact that he's flaming a former player and like being so open about it. But like, what was he doing? Like throwing yeah. a just finish the ice cream cone. What? It, what yeah, it, just hold it. Like, I don't, I don't know. know. Like, I, I was rewatching Curb Your Enthusiasm. He's like, you know, he's like in a conversation with a guy who's like reaming him out. And he's like, do you ever hate this when it's like dripping down the side? That's kind of what I was picturing. Like, <laughs> I, I can't eat like. To that and he also i think he slipped up at first he said chargers and so if he had just left it at that i think the whole fan yeah. base would have been like who, who, who was a chargers player but yeah. i think it's hilarious that the second he said rams because we know they got a good player for yeah for for kenny young the second he said rams everybody knew who it was and he I, I i we have i don't think we have gotten a kenny young comment on that on that soundbite yet i don't know if we ever will i don't know if kenny young is still playing maybe i'm wrong about that i don't i i do not think he is and by the yeah. way it was Kohler over likely I did confirm so I'll confirm the Kenny Young thing next but I would be very curious to hear what uh what what Kenny Young would have to say about that story yeah I mean hopefully I mean nothing against him like obviously the cost is talking bad about him who like doesn't seem to breathe a bad word about anyone uh save for maybe certain local media personalities uh that's it might not (laughs) bode well for you but um yeah it I don't know if he does wind up on a roster again sometime hopefully somebody puts the dots together because like, that's like a, that's a thing that only people here are going to zero in on. Let's say he goes to like Minnesota or something. I'm not sure anyone out there is going to even really be aware that this interview took place, but yeah, great interview. It was uh, a yeah. funny. You, you hear DaCosta go on with like Florio or something and he'll do like these like 20 minute, like podcast hits and it's like remote and like, you don't really get much out of them. Like this was really well done by Brenneman. I thought it was kind of like a panel style. They're both in person together. They went for like over an hour and uh, yeah, that was, that was really good. I, I hope we get to see more of those. Yeah, I also am curious what the flavor of the ice cream was, because I'm thinking it was when I I don't know, like when you first heard it, was there a specific flavor that like came? Because for me, it was vanilla. Like, I'm like, OK, vanilla, yeah, vanilla. You, you, you nailed me there. I thought vanilla for sure. I'm a chocolate guy, personally. I, mint chocolate chip cookie dough for me. I mean, I've actually learned to like vanilla. It used to be like, oh, this is so like it's a kid. You're like, this is so bland. Like, why? You know, what, what's with vanilla? But. I've actually learned to like it. And I, I don't know what color to cost his offices, but I can just like the, the like, I think, I mean, it's vanilla. Been I think he's got like a, an off white, like eggshell, uh, um, well, you okay. know, so not, from- not as bad if it was vanilla then, but like, if yeah. it was chocolate, you know, you got like the brown smear just like all over the wall. The castle kind of looks like a middle school from the interior. Like I, you know, for, does. for palatial and amazing as it looks on the outside, you know, and like, I, it's obviously like state of the art and everything on the oh, outside. 100%. Yeah. A little bit, of, you know, maybe we can <laughs> spice it up a little bit, get some wood paneling in there. Kind of give oh, us that'd a be nice. Yeah, that'd be nice. 
absolutely. All right, that is uh, quite the diversion, and let's move on to the next one. Certainly probably not at the level of the uh, receiver and offensive line. Uh, you know, very cyclical, but definitely some players who can come in right away and probably compete to start for us. Um, we would love to add a talented corner at some point in the draft, whether that's first round or second round, third round, whatever that might be, a talented player who can help us. That's a position, as you all know, that you know typically you never have enough due to injuries and different things. The guys will break down throughout the course of the season. I think our depth has always been tested in the secondary. This year was no exception, and we were we were blessed to have some guys like, for instance, Ronald Darby come in and, and really help us. And so, yeah, if we have a chance to draft a corner this year, you can you can count on us doing. Is cornerback a slept on need for you right now? I think it's a huge one, personally, and. Part of it has to do with the fact, and DaCosta kind of said it right there. I mean, I'm, I'll never forget in 2014 when they literally had to sign Rashad Melvin off the street after losing like six straight corners. Like, it seems like every, and you know, Spencer and I have talked about it, you and I have talked about it. It's like they start the year with 50 million healthy corners and they end the year with two, like almost every single year without fail. But then you kind of look at the state of the room right now. Ronald Darby's loss, and that was one that kind of stung for me a little bit when talking about the roster in general. Thought he came in and played really well coming off the ACL. He suffered, a, in, I think it was like week five of two years ago for Denver, but he played really well. Not that they can't get another guy like that, or not that they can't get other production from other guys, but it would just it would feel a lot better to me personally, Jake, if like we knew who Jalen Armand Davis was or we knew who Pepe Williams was. Like it just feels like we don't. And we talk about, especially with the edge guys, of like, Oh, David Ajabo has a ton of potential. Like Adafi always has been solid, but he has a ton of potential. But you can't put all your eggs in the potential basket because sometimes it just doesn't work out. So it'd be a lot easier of a decision to say, yeah, we well, can kind of hold off on this need because you know who Jalen Armour Davis is. You know who Kevin Williams is. But we, we just don't. And then you look at also like a, a Brandon Stevens who played incredible football for them, really stepped up, but he's, uh, he's a free agent next year. So – with the extension, like I personally, I'm like signed Brandon Stevens to an extension yesterday, but yeah. we saw with guys like Matabike and Queen and all these guys of like essentially betting on them. And I know Queen had the option to decline and everything, but essentially guys balling out in kind. So the Ravens had like seven guys just ball out in contract years and turn that into big paydays. So I wouldn't blame Brandon Stevens if the Ravens approach him, maybe even have approached him already and said, all right, yeah, we, we'd love to get you under this team-friendly deal that's, you know, good for both of us. And Steven says, well, I just saw all my teammates fall out and earn themselves incredible paydays. I'm going to go that route. And the corner position's a premium one. With Marlon, I know there's a lot of conversation about his contract and restructuring, and, and I know people are saying just go cut him, which is not realistic right now, by the way. But, like, there's been all that conversation to where there is going to be a conversation about Marlon's contract probably starting next season. So I'm not saying take a corner. This corner class is interesting where I, I mentioned it earlier. The sweet spot to me is like second to fourth round. So like a Kyrie Jackson out of Oregon, some of those, Renardo Green out of Florida State. Like you can get those guys on day two and I'd feel totally comfortable there. And we know the Ravens love like three outside corner rotations. We saw it with them last year with Humphrey and Stevens and Darby. I mean, you go back to the Jimmy Smith, Marcus Peters and Marlon Days, go back to even like Brandon Carr. You can keep going back. Corner's always going to be a need for them. And not that they have to spend a first round pick this year. Like they're going to, they're not going to be in like an Arnold range or a Kenyon Mitchell range. They're not going to be there. Kool-Aid McKinstry is kind of the guy where if he falls, that'd be the first corner I'd probably consider. I've seen him much him a few times. Yeah. It, it's pro it's him, but then it's a lot of those other, like Ennis Rakestraw was a first round guy, but he didn't really test well. So now he's in the second round. So I think you can still get, a good offensive lineman in the first round, good edge guy, good wide receiver, and then you can address corner later, but that doesn't necessarily take it away as a need because we could be sitting here next year, Jake, and, oh, well, Brandon Stevens either is gone or signed a huge extension, and that kind of limits things. Is Marlon gone at that point? Did they do enough to address corner? Because and the Costa knows, every team knows, you don't just build a team for this upcoming year. It's obviously two years, three years, four years, five years down the line. And so while corner is not as big of a need as offensive line, not as big of a need right now is probably wide receiver. I probably have it. Honestly, this might be my controversial take. I have it above edge just because of the fact that we don't really have a lot of certainty of that position past this upcoming year. 
Yeah, I compare it a lot to offensive line in the way that there's a lot of young guys who like, you know, it'd be great if they turn into something, but like yeah. it, you're really, you're kind of playing with fire there. And, um, you know, you've got a, a solid veteran there in Mullet who you bring back. Obviously, it's very nice to have, but yeah, you lose Darby, that's tough. And basically what you're hoping to do, and I think it's going to be similar to O-line, I'm expecting them to draft at least one and then try to sign another one of these veterans. And we'll see maybe if it is one of those kind of off the heap signings like Darby and Mullet both were, and they both worked out very well. Uh, I think it would be, or maybe you make a trade. Uh, if things aren't working out for you early in the season, kind of like they did with Will Davis, you know, nine years ago, uh, and that worked out okay. So you know, it's it's just one of those things where you're going to have to monitor it. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah I mean, we talked right at the beginning uh, of the off season, right to the season, about you know the type of guy, the type of role that that he felt would fit, and we were all on the same page with that part of it. You know, like in terms of our roster, kind of what would be comfortable and who we're looking for style wise. Uh, but it doesn't always work out that way. So Lamar, you know, he's he's been he's been tasked over the text, you know, world with a couple couple of assignments, right? So uh, we'll see who he likes, you know. And he looks at guys on tape, and and he's never been shy about giving his opinion uh, on, on free agents or the or the draft. So uh, he hasn't he hasn't weighed in quite yet, but uh, he will. So. Sorry to cut you off with John there. No, you're good. You're good. Next topic is. Lamar Jackson giving input on draft choices. Are you in or out on this? I, I, I'm I'm in. I am in. And my, my point about the corner room, my, my one that I was going to make, is that their nickel room right now is actually really good. It's Millette, Williams, and, and Ardarius Washington. It's really outside yeah. where you got to gotta worry. But it's back to Lamar. I mean, we, we kind of heard this even like during the whole contract saga where – he was like, all right, I would really like to play with Odell. I'd really like to play with DeAndre Hopkins. And obviously the Ravens in good faith were like, oh, hey, you know what? We're going to show you that we value you. And they went out there and got, you know, it was an overpay contractually for Odell. I think we can say that now. But I do think that with Lamar, I mean, we heard this last year where he was really in on the South Florida receivers. Obviously, Zay was one of those, but Tank Dell was another guy who really liked. Like, I feel like he's always really in on the South oh, Florida. Oh, yeah. There might be a little bit of a bias there. Uh, yeah, a um, um, thousand percent. Like there, there's no doubt about it. But I do think it almost it's we're in a player empowerment era now. And this goes across all sports. Like, you know, I think we hear a lot of it talk about in basketball with the NBA and like, oh, well, all oh, yeah. these players are requesting trades in the NBA. And like it's about the player. But it, it goes beyond that where it's like all sports were in this player empowerment era. And I don't think that you know, with these decisions, obviously Eric DaCosta has the final say in all this. He is the the decision maker, the team builder, but it goes so far beyond Eric DaCosta when it comes to how this team is actually built, when it comes to the scouts and the coaching staff and everybody having input. I do think that especially it doesn't have to be every single player, right? I don't think you go one through 53 and hand out a survey and you're like, all right, well, name us five prospects and we're going to go get them. Like, that's not how it works. But obviously you want to install a vote of confidence with your quarterback in this team to say, hey, I'm being heard, I'm being listened to. And Lamar and every quarterback does have preferences in terms of what types of targets they like to throw to, what types of guys they like to throw to, who they'd like to play with and kind of team up with. So there's no guarantee that any, any of those guys actually come to Baltimore. But I do think that it's part of the plan to kind of have this be Lamar's offense where it's also – yeah, you know what, we're, you know, with the audibles and with kind of the freedom at the line of scrimmage, that's one part of it. But then another part is we're also going to take your input on who you like, and that doesn't mean we're going to go out there and get everybody to tell us, but it gives us an idea of what you do like and what skill sets and what types of players. So even if it's not this specific guy, we now have that tucked away and we know what you like to play with and who you like to play with. Yeah, I think you put it well there where it's an, kind of a necessary goodwill tax, right? Where you, you put your tithe into the box there and you say, hey, like, you know, what can we do for you? Who, who are you liking this year? That kind of thing. Um, and I think it was helpful where, you know, he mentions Beckham and then they go sign Beckham. I would have signed Beckham for $30 million a year if it led to them getting to re-sign Lamar. And you know what? It did. And they paid $15 million a year. And guess what? They got a decent season out of him anyway. And they almost went to the Super Bowl. So, I, you know, I, I'd redo that deal in a heartbeat. Um, it's yeah. And I think it definitely, it, it's good for the goodwill and it's good to know what type of player he likes to play with, I guess, where the only thing where it's like, I'd say, take the advice, but maybe don't fully heed it a hundred percent of the time. If you think you might have something better or you want to do things a little bit differently. Cause I mean, this goes all the way back to Joe Flacco handpicking Tandon Doss out of, uh, Indiana uh, or whatever, wherever he came from. I always go back to that. Uh, but it also like, 
you know, I, the South Florida bias and like these little speedy guys, like it, it's worked out really well with Zay Flowers so far. We'll see, you know, what happens with him and his career. It's still early. Hollywood Brown, I'd say that was a good draft pick, not great. And obviously, you know, that sort of bore itself out as not being great with the fact that they shipped him off. And, you know, now he's on his third team in five years or whatever he's been in the league. So I don't know. It's kind of one of those things where I want to see some size added to this wide receiver room. I think it's time we we've monkeyed around and toyed around with this, you know, let's throw a bunch of five, you know, sub six foot guys out there. Not to, not to rag on my short Kings again. Like, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That point. And then we'll just rely on Mark Andrews and likely to be those size guys. I want to see some size on the perimeter. I want to see a guy that can fly and go win a one-on-one -on -one matchup. And there are guys to be had in this class. When you look at AD Mitchell, Keon Coleman, some of these guys that have some, have some real size to them and can go up and get the ball uh, vertically and can challenge dudes uh, on the perimeter. And people talk about Bolden. I think Bolden was that to an extent, but he was more of a slot receiver than I think some people remember. I really do kind of look at the fact that I look at that 2019 draft and, you know, it's, it's so easy to say in retrospect. And a lot of people do belabor this point, but man, Hollywood Brown over AJ Brown and DK Metcalf in the next round. That is, I feel like that's going to haunt them for a long time unless they, you know, go and get this thing fixed. And it's not that even just Hollywood Brown is a small guy. Like if they had gotten this great receiver who was his same size and, you know, he was on a second contract here, that would have been great. But I don't know. I'm, I'm just ready to mix it up a little bit. And if Lamar is like saying, oh, let's just go get this another fast guy from South Florida. I mean, I'm a little hesitant. I, I'd maybe like push back a little bit and say, hey, what, what do you think about maybe changing things up? And it, it also depends on what Monken wants to do. So there's there's a lot that goes into it. And like you said, it's worth its weight in gold to engender that goodwill with him and let him have a say. So I'm, I'm into it. I'm, I'm certainly into it, but I don't know. I think, um, I think sometimes you, you gotta, you gotta make the kid eat his, his vegetables a little bit. And <laughs> that's not necessarily, that's not a one-to-one -one thing with Lamar here at all. He's very much an adult. He should be involved in the, the decision-making process. And like John said, he's doing his homework here. So that's great. Um, but yeah, let's get some size in this receiver room. That's, I think that's just my overall point there. Yeah. Uh, I'm with you. Um, they have two really, and you know, with Odell last year, they had three really incredible. I think they were the best route running receiving group in the league last year. Personally, I was saying that all up and down. And now with Beckham gone, they still have two really good route runners who can get open, but they don't have that like six, two, six, three jump ball, bigger bodied player. I mean, obviously with Mark Andrews and Isaiah likely sure. Like that can be your guy, but to your point, it's like, you don't want to necessarily rely on those guys. You want to have someone in your receiving room who can do that. So I've been saying it all up and down locked on Ravens. I'm a thousand percent with you where you don't need one of these like 5'11, 185 guys anymore who can, you know, get open, be shifty and run routes. You have that. It's that the guy could be the most talented receiver in the world, but you do have to have some diversification in terms of skill set. And Lamar really hasn't had that like big body jump ball receiver over his tenure. I mean, I know they kind of tried to make Miles Boykin that like terror of size and speed, but he played like he was 5'11". Like that was the issue. Like tell that to the Lamar, Giants. they were never on the same page. Like well, tell us to the Giants. Invest <laughs> in Miles that's Boykin. right. That's right. Yep. Ravens and Steelers legend now, Miles Boykin. So. Yeah. I mean, that's what, what a career. I mean, we talk about people that didn't cross the picket line between Steelers and Ravens. Miles Boykin, one of the, one of the top yeah. names to do so. Yeah. And, I think that's the, where the queen thing comes in because like, you know, Alejandro Villanueva crossed over, Millette crossed over, but it's been a while since we, you know, a guy who was in like second contract territory and gets that big of a deal moves over. I mean, obviously everybody points to like Rod Woodson and, and that whole thing. And there have been a couple of names, but you know, that wasn't second contract Rod Woodson who was coming over, you know, I think for it wasn't really much of a rivalry yet by that point. Yeah. You know, he signed and it was still, it was still more so Titans, but like, you yeah. know, things were still going on, but you know what? I'm, I, I, I know we talked about it the first time Derek Henry and Patrick queen meet in the middle, mm. everybody in Baltimore, regardless of what happens is going to be plastering what happened all over social media. There's no doubt about it. Yep. Absolutely. As well. well, first I think, you know, Trenton is going to have a great season. He's great attitude. I think he grew as much as anybody this year. It's tough, you know, for young players, um, he, he showed up on special teams. When he played on defense, he made some plays late in the year. Got a lot of talent. I mean, he's as talented as any inside linebacker in this year's draft class, for sure. So excited about him. Uh, I think we've got some other young players um, that, you know, 
can emerge as well that we're excited about uh, at that position. The draft, we've looked at some guys, definitely some talent in this year's draft class. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good class. There's no, like, top ten probably inside linebackers in this draft class, but there's a lot of depth in the second and third and fourth rounds. And so certainly a position we'll look at, particularly if they can play on special teams and help us that way too, which is a really important part of the inside linebacker position evaluation-wise. Um, but we like our young guys that we have. Excited about those guys, and uh, and we'll see how the whole how the whole. Yeah, so I'm glad you kind of brought up the Patrick Queen moving on thing there. How confident are you in Trenton Simpson just kind of slotting in there next to uh, next to Uncle Row? And do you think that they're going to make a move in the draft or uh, over the summer to uh, at least bring some competition in here for him? I would love it if they did, but I think. And DeCosta kind of said it right there. I think they're pretty confident. I, honestly, if there was a siding where I think John Harbaugh just lit up, I think Chris Board was that. Like, I think John Harbaugh yeah. was just all over that Chris Board siding and was like, this is my Super Bowl. <laughs> like, because I think Chris Board was John Harbaugh's Super Bowl. Now, there's not, obviously, with Roquan and Trenton Simpson, you're not going to invest an early round pick into an inside linebacker here. I could see them taking a guy because they have nine picks and with the new kickoff rules and everything, I do think that it is more valuable to specifically covet something the Ravens have been doing, but specifically covet those special teams players. So if they take a guy with one of their 200 picks or late 100, I, I would not be shocked whatsoever. I think with Simpson, I am confident. I think we saw the flashes against the Steelers in that week 18 game. I think there will be some growing pains. Now, obviously, Roquan being there does ease a lot of that. I just think there is, you know, we talked about kind of like, you know, with the tax for Lamar and, and him with those decisions. It is on the good side of the tax, the Roquan tax, where everybody just gets a Roquan boost, essentially, is what it is. So I think that eases things a little, but. I do think that it is going to take a little bit of time here. And Simpson is one of those players where like you talk about some of the edge depth as well. They can't really use him as much on the edge now, but he does have that versatility. I mean, Malik Harrison has the same thing where they bring a guy like Malik Harrison back. I think Baltimore's really excited about Malik Harrison too. So I wouldn't be shocked if early, and we, we kind of see this happen, Jake, where we always pencil in a young guy at a spot. Not that Simpson won't have a role early in the season, but I do maybe expect it to be like a Simpson Harrison rotation a little bit next to Roquan before Simpson kind of takes it over as the middle of the season comes. We've seen that, especially on the offensive line. I mean, I remember, I can't remember who he won the job over, but DJ Fluker starting at right guard in 2021. A lot of people had, I can't remember free who agent, it was. Free agent guard, DJ Fluker. That is right. Crazy. It could, could come back potentially. But uh, got to go back to move forward. <laughs> you know, it's almost like the Thanos thing. Where does your failures bring you back to me? And That's it's, uh, yeah, it, it's Fluker. But I wouldn't be shocked if we see maybe a Simpson-Harrison rotation early and then Simpson kind of grabs that role as the season goes on. But Simpson and Queen, I mean, they knew what they were doing. Similar-ish skill sets, not exactly the same player. But at this point, Simpson is their guy. I don't expect him to go out there and kind of make a big addition to challenge him. If there were to be an addition, it'd more so be a special teams guy or just a depth piece in case something goes catastrophically wrong. Yeah, and I think the familiarity with board is big too. If it were just some random schmuck that they get off the uh, get off the scrap heap, like maybe you, you'd be a little bit more concerned. But I think board is going to come in. I don't know how well he necessarily knows the defense. I don't know how much he played under McDonald necessarily. But you got to think there's going to be a lot of crossover between what McDonald did and what Orr is going to do. I, yeah, I don't think they're going to go the draft route either. I do think they probably will sign maybe one more guy. I don't know. Maybe it's just another Christian Welch type where you kind of bring him in and he's kind of you know one-to-one -one with board and it's like, all right, who's going to win this job is sort of that third guy getting snaps. But overall, yeah, I think it is sort of a Simpsons job to lose here. And, um, you know, he, he's going to sink or swim. And we saw that with Patrick Queen. He really got thrown into the mix uh, in a way that Simpson didn't. Simpson got a chance to sit. Uh, and now you've got that chance to sit. You've got some time under your belt. And like I said, sink or swim. So, yeah. And, and at this point too, and I give Queen a lot of credit because and all the 2020 guys, honestly, that 2020 COVID year was not easy for rookies. I know we, we, you and I have talked about it before where it was all virtual workouts, virtual meetings. Like they didn't have that in person where for rookies, I think that's really important. And for Simpson, he, you know, he had all that. So that's valuable just for any player, for any young guy. But 
it took a little time for all these 2020 guys like a queen, a Matt, a I mean, we knew who Dobbins was. He it was kind of the opposite for Dobbins where great rookie season, then the injuries kind of had the wheels fall off, but I'm excited for Simpson. And I don't I think the thing I'm more looking at is, is, is he going to change the number over from 30? There are some single digit numbers now still available. Uh, I know that there has been some rumblings and maybe Keaton Mitchell is going to change the single digit number from 34. We'll see, but that it's always the, the fashion tweets, which uh, I think are, are a lot more popular in the fan base than people think they are. Pure chaos with these numbers. <laughs> hey, get it together. NFL. Like, yeah. Linebackers wearing single digits, all this. You, you know, and I, I talked about it, but the most atrocious one was when Teddy Bridgewater wore 50 for like that one week period last year. I was like, there is a limit to how this can go. And that is just, uh, that might have led to his retirement. Yeah, that's when he proved he was senile in football terms. He's like, you know what? I'm a quarterback who's going to wear number 50. It's pure. It's anarchy. Get, get your house in order, NFL. Come on. 50, 50 should never be anywhere near. A, only a defensive lineman in the number 50 should be near a quarterback in the number 50. On it's, a quarterback, almost, no. uh, it's almost so preposterous that it's sick. Like, that's the kind of thing that uh, I, I, I'm kind of into. But it, it's, yeah, it's not quite there where I can get into it. So I thought it was a pair. I mean, you know, with all these parody accounts nowadays, I'm like, oh, okay, this is a joke. And then now he really showed up and was in a game with the number 50. And I'm just like, I mean, imagine if Lamar showed up, just how much aura would be lost if Lamar was wearing 50. Especially for like, like nothing against Teddy Bridgewater. Good guy, good quarterback, but like just nebbish Teddy Bridgewater, you know, with the, the frail kind of arms and legs. And like, you know, he's kind of like a, just a nebbish, wispy guy. He's going to wear number 50. Like, they, you know, if anyone's going to do that, like maybe Josh Allen, but like, I, you know, overall. I could see Josh Allen in 50. There was a Photoshop of Derrick Henry in 55. And I'm like, I mean, it kind of fits. Like, yeah. I, I could see it, but no, 50 on a quarterback should not be a thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, number one, I'm, I'm not a patient person. I've learned from Ozzy, who is extremely patient, to be more patient. Um, but I don't think it's a philosophy necessarily as much as an opportunity. So I look at every single year as being different. Every opportunity is different. Every situation might be different. But we've got to be able to pounce when there is an opportunity that we think is beneficial to the club. And so whether that's doing something in March or April or May or September or November, we're going to do that, given the parameters of the situation and where we are as, at a, as a team at that time. We've danced around a little bit about sort of these uh, summer waves signings that they made last season, where it really backfilled a ton of the roster and front filled it in a lot of ways, where you sign Clowney in the summer, you sign Van Noy halfway through September. I mean, almost into October at that point, Darby, Mollett, a lot of these guys. Do you think they're going to have that same aggression this year? I feel like they kind of need to because they have a lot of needs at these positions and it's not all going to be filled in the draft. Yeah, they've lost a lot of guys. And, you know, if we start getting up there and I know Jake, you were saying like that 12, 13, 14, like anything past that's kind of crazy. But if we get up into there, then you'll probably see a lot of rookies make this team. But the, the difference in one of them, and it's not, you know, either guy doing it wrong. I think both strategies work. But the difference between Eric DaCosta and Ozzie Newsome is I think Ozzie was very much, we're going to give these guys a ton of time, and especially with rookies, and we're going to make sure that they have an opportunity. Maybe it's just going to take a couple of years. But Eric DaCosta, it's like, if it's not working, like, get out of here. Like, we saw it, like, with Sean Wade, Caillou Blue Kelly. For all of Eric DaCosta's solid draft track record, the fifth round has not been very kind to him. That's that's the one round where Eric DaCosta, there has been a weakness there. So when, you know, DaCosta's there talking about, yeah, we'll make a move for the club in September, make a move for the club in November. We never really saw the Ravens get super aggressive at the trade deadline under Ozzy because I think that he just wanted everything to kind of gel and say, all right, we're going to have these guys for a full season, see what happens, we'll make the necessary moves in the offseason. One of the favorites, one of my favorite stories I do tell is with Tyus Bowser and Tim Williams back during that 2018 season, where it was both, it was their third year each, I think. Bowser was a second rounder, Williams was a third rounder. And it was a big pivotal spot for both those guys. And Tyus Bowser started to show something, and Tim Williams did not. And DaCosta was like, all right, Tim, you're out of here. And they signed LJ Fort, they signed Josh Bynes. But that was after two back-to-back 500-yard -back performances given up by the defense per game, not total, per game, 1,000 total yards in two games. So with DaCosta and kind of his way of doing things, I think he does like to kind of sit back and take his time. But if it's not working for him, it's it's not working. Like something is going to change where it just wasn't that way a ton under Ozzy, which again is fine. I'm not trying to say one is wrong or the other is right. But we're going to see, I think, after the draft, especially once that comp pick formula doesn't really factor anymore and that deadline is over, 
I think that's when, and it's kind of the classic Baltimore thing where they're going to pounce. They're going to have those comp picks locked up. They're still going to be a bunch of really quality players. And that's when I think Baltimore is going to do a lot of their work. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting with the, him talking about being impatient and kind of seeing that as a negative quality. I think the NFL is a much more immediate league than when Ozzy was in his prime. And I think it's not really talked about how Ozzy did kind of peter out as a GM a little bit in the mid 2010s. He, he didn't seem to be interested in making investments at wide receiver to help Flacco, which I think were necessary. He kind of wanted to go all in on this, just get comp picks every year, just fill out the defense and we'll just figure it out on offense with odds and ends. And I think that really did kind of cost them some some competitive seasons. They were kind of you know floating around 500, sometimes above it, sometimes right at it, occasionally even under it. Um, he just didn't seem to have his finger on the pulse in that post-2011 CBA that I mentioned earlier that just really sped up the clock on these rookies, made everything a lot more immediate and a lot more pressing. The media market even changing a little bit with the social media and everything. It just makes everything in, in the entire world and sports by extension just seems so much more immediate, so much more pressing. And I think DaCosta, for better and worse to his point, but I think for better in a lot of cases, is much more attuned to that and much more willing to kind of pull the trigger when it's time to make a move and you got to fill a need. I don't know, like sometimes it's okay to just sort of throw concern for tomorrow out the window and just go and make a move. And I don't know, he seems very attuned to that. And I do think that, uh, I guess back to the original question, I do expect we will see some of these summer signings happen again. And I think well that they should because, Overall, it's really not going to hurt you if you sign one of these guys to a one-year deal and it doesn't work out. And like we saw last year, they did it four or five times and it worked out probably four different ways. So uh, I'm all in on the idea of them doing it. I think they will. Yeah, and for DaCosta as well, you mentioned you know, him filling a need in a trade. He's done a good job of that. But even like he'll go out there and trade for a guy where a lot of people are like, where is the need here? Like Roquan, when they traded for Roquan, it was like, well, what do you mean? You, you drafted Patrick Queen a couple of years ago with a first round pick. Why are you trading a second for an inside linebacker? And at the time, it's like, yeah, Roquan's one of the best middle linebackers in the league. And it's something that I think people had kind of highlighted inside linebackers like this is an iffy position, but it wasn't like the top need on the team. A lot of people were talking about wide receiver. A lot of people were talking about corner. And they went out there and they got an inside linebacker. When they traded for Marcus Peters, they were deep at corner. But they traded for Marcus Peters, and there were still, I mean, people are still talking about wide receivers. It's been a constant theme in the Ravens' history, so it's no surprise there. But DaCosta also, it's it's just his feel for maybe this position isn't like the biggest need right now, but this player fits exactly what we do. We're going to find a spot for him, and it's worked for him pretty much every single trade he's made. Yeah, no doubt. And we've got our last one coming up right now. Oh, man, you never know, Jeff. You just never know. I mean, it just depends. If the phone rings, maybe there's a move to be made. If there's a player that a coach comes in and says, this guy's really good, or, or George comes in, or whatever it might be, then we could make a move. I think, in general, you know, Kyle was one of the last things on my checklist trying to get that done because I think he, he checked off a lot of different boxes for us, veteran presence on defense, uh, multiple roles on defense, you know, uh, just a, a good solid player for us at a position where we could use some depth. So, uh, you know, I don't know that we'll do a lot in the next couple of weeks other than really kind of polish the board up and get ready for the process. If you had to put a percentage on it, let's call it the first round and the second round, but I'm really curious about the first round. What percentage would you put on the chances of them trading up? I know we kind of talked about this already, but if you had to put a number on it. I'll give it, I'll say 30% chance that they make some sort of move in the first round with trading up. I think it's possible. I mean, the thing, though, is with these four comp picks they're going to get next year, I think that makes it a little easier because if you start to get into next year's draft capital and you see a guy you really, really like at 25, at 23, let's say, you can move up and give a third round pick next year or a fourth round pick next year, knowing that you have those comp picks coming in. And again, there's only going to be one opportunity to go get that guy. And if there is a fall for an offensive lineman or a fall for a corner or an edge guy or a wide receiver, and you're sitting there thinking there's no way that anybody expected this to happen. I'd be totally fine if Baltimore were to move up anywhere from five to 10 spots. I think you start to get a little dicey, especially for Raven standards. When you start talking about giving away next year's first or next year's second, I think the way that this roster is going to have to be constructed, 
those high, high draft picks are so valuable. But if it's about giving up a third next year or a fourth next year, or even just packaging a couple of these picks to move up even one or two spots, I think that they could do it. I'm not saying it's a, it's a likely scenario, but I do think there's a bigger chance than people are giving. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. I think 30% is the exact number that I had in my mind. And obviously it goes up like, you know, trading up two spots is not like ma a massive trade up necessarily. And that's probably what I'm talking about. And that makes the chances even higher. So maybe I'd put that at like a 40 for them to say, like, jump one team or two teams and go get this guy that they really like. And to the uh, point from the earlier question, Eric DaCosta, impatient guy. So if one of these guys that he really likes starts to fall, let's say it's an offensive lineman. Let's say it's that flashy big body receiver that we like. Let's say it's an uh, edge rusher or a, uh, a cornerback who could really help them this year and also down the line. Wouldn't shock me at all to see them move up a little bit because it's not going to be a ton of capital, like you said, to move up just a couple of spots. And, um, you know, it, it keeps that fifth year option in play, which we talked about earlier as well. So I'm into the idea. Uh, and I don't know, I like if it does to get to that point, like you said, I remember that Kyle Hamilton night too. And yeah. I'm a quasi, no, I'm a t-shirt Notre Dame fan, Irish Catholic, you know, my mom got her master's there. So nice. very familiar with Kyle Hamilton. And I wanted that thing to happen. Spenny was sitting there sweating and hoping Jordan Davis would make it to them. He did <laughs> not. I think that worked out okay. Uh, on my end. Uh, that's maybe the one draft take that I, I was probably correct on over him. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's just one of those things where if one of those guys does start to fall that we're in love with, I, I kind of hope that they do, uh, or I should say that they don't sort of tempt the fates this time and they do jump up and just secure them. Now, I'm still shocked they were able to get Hamilton at 14. And I was sure once the Eagles traded ahead of Baltimore and they, they had that for like two straight years, the Eagles were trading ahead of Baltimore for guys that I wanted and that a lot of the fan base wanted. I was sure it was going to be Hamilton, but again, I, I, those things rarely happen, especially for a guy falling like a pretty consensus top seven guy in Kyle Hamilton to 14. It's a little different when you start getting into the thirties and twenties, as opposed to the teens. But again, this is the Ravens window right now. And if there's a guy that fits what they need at a specific position, and he's a guy that is extremely talented and shouldn't be anywhere near the spot he's in, in terms of him falling, I would not be opposed to them moving a couple of, pretty high level draft picks for that guy because you want to make sure you take advantage of Lamar Jackson's prime. And this is, we're not talking about giving a 35 year old, a five year, hundred million dollar deal. This is a young player that's going to be there for a long time. Hopefully if everything works out and this class is talented enough where there could be a couple of guys who we're kind of sitting there wondering why isn't this guy getting taken? And then maybe DaCosta does make that move. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a delicate, you know, line to dance because, you know, like we said in the past, like you want to have as many draft picks as possible. You want to have as many lottery tickets as you can, but obviously, you know, they, they peter out in value the further down you go. So what are you willing to give up uh, and what makes sense to give up, to move up and go and get that guy? And is he your guy? And uh, you know, it's uh, what makes the draft so fascinating and so much fun, just like it was so much fun to sit down and talk with you, my friend. I told you before we got going here, got you on at late notice, which I appreciate that we keep it nice and short. You know, a nice little short recap of the Liars luncheon, and here we are an hour and 20 into this thing. So don't want to uh, keep you too much longer. I hope you had uh, hope you had fun doing this. Uh, just any any last thoughts before we get out of here? No, I had a blind. I'm known to be a rambler, so I, I had... I feel very, like it's probably not. Nice. You've got to keep the you've got to keep the daily episodes a little bit shorter. So may, you get you got a chance to really kind of. That's true. That's true. Yeah. For, for for locked on Ravens is about anywhere from twenty five to 35, 40 minutes. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really have an opportunity to get on and just kind of ramble like this. So it was fun. And anytime you need me, man, more than happy to hop on here with you. Yep, absolutely. Uh, don't uh, don't say that to me too often because I probably will start to <laughs> to abuse that power. But uh, before we uh, get you out of here, how about you plug your social media, your show, what you're doing with Ripkin and the boys? How about you get it all out there for the uh, the good listeners? Yeah, for sure. So you can find me for social media. It's uh, Twitter and Instagram at Chaos Striker Thirty Four. Uh, for my show, it's Locked On Ravens. So we do Ravens content five days plus more per week. So. It's both in video form on YouTube. You can like and subscribe over there. Also in audio form, wherever you get your favorite podcasts and the podcasting platforms. And then, yeah, Ryan Ripken show now. I'm kind of dipping my toe that will full body, honestly, into the baseball world with the Orioles and uh, exciting times with how good they are. So you can find us over again on YouTube. Also trying to push out the audio form of that. That's a longer format one. That's about 
hour and a half to two hours. And we talk about everything, Orioles, Ravens, big topics. So uh, we'll have to get you on there, Jake, because that's fun. It gets you down to the studio. And I'd love you, to. I've been in that studio a couple times. I'm a big yeah, fan. Yeah, you, you, can, you can contribute even more to the tall to short factor. where Because Rocco is the second short king, and he doesn't come in the studio really a ton. So it's, you know... You can yeah. be the fourth six foot plus guy in there and I'll just tower over me and look over me like that. Yeah, I'd love to get in there to uh, shop it up with you guys. And I'd love to uh, give Zach shit his take that The Office is the, the greatest show of all time. Listen, oh, I, yeah, we, we, we talk about a lot. Oh, yeah, man. I love The Office, but that's, that's a rough look for our guy. <laughs> I know it's tough. I mean, I, I'm classic Office, Parks and Rec. Like th those are those are my types of shows. So I'm all over it. I'm into it. Listen, I'm into it. But greatest of all time, that's, you know, it's kind of like the LeBron Jordan. Maybe we'll get in that's there. True. And, yeah. yeah. We'll pour out some uh, pour out some glasses of wine and we'll really break it down like LeBron yeah. and uh, JJ Reddick there. But uh, <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, good times as always talking to you, pal. Thank you uh, for joining me. Uh, for anyone listening, if it's your first time, feel free to subscribe to us there on YouTube. Just pass the uh, the 2K mark there. So uh, pumping the numbers and uh, keeping this thing going and growing steadily, which is very nice. Leave a comment to help pump the algorithm a little bit. You can find us on social media at exit 52 podcast across the board, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all that good stuff. And I am at Jake Luke. That's L O U Q U E. So more, uh, more Ravens and draft content coming your way in the coming weeks. Uh, it's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, love the draft very much. We'll see what our plans are for live streaming. Maybe get down to Jimmy's for the party that they have there. And then I will be swiftly out of town for a bachelor party in Los Angeles. My second time there in uh, less than two months. So that's going to be quite something. It's going to be a, a whirlwind as my life has been uh, for the past few months, it feels like. But uh, it's always great fun and it's great fun to talk Ravens. And uh, we appreciate you guys listening. So uh, in the meantime, we will see you later. Really, really hard, and they execute the system, and that's what it's all about. Yes, there sir. Trust. Big, 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 big trust. trust. Big, big trust. trust. Hey, yes, sir. <laughs> right on cue. Hey, right on cue. Hey, I, let me.